The Triathlon Show 258. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show. The podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Professor Grégoire Millet. Professor Millet is one of the world's foremost researchers in the field of altitude training and hypoxic training in general. And uh, not only is he a great researcher, but he has a background himself as an elite triathlete and a coach. So he's uh, not just somebody who knows everything about the science, but actually how to apply these things in the real world as well. So in this episode, we will go into many, many details, both uh, the physiological, but also the practical and training structure wise about altitude training, how to get the most out of altitude training camps, why everybody can benefit from them. There really is no such thing as non-responders. But we also talk a little bit towards the end about a few of the world's best athletes that uh, Professor Mollet has worked with and published data from, including Martin Fourcard, who is the most successful biathlete of the last decade and the most successful French Olympian of all time, and Kylian Journet, who I'm sure most of you know who is, a mountaineer, trail and mountain runner, and uh, summited Mount Everest twice in a week without supplemental oxygen in uh, super fast times for that ascent. So uh, it's an exciting interview we have coming up. We'll get right into it after thanking our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And they have developed an online sweat test that you can use to get a good ballpark estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And with that information, you also get uh, a really good uh, starting point for a race hydration plan that you can use right out. And uh, then, of course, as time goes by and you do more races, you can do some fine tuning to it. But it's uh, really amazing how uh, far you can get with just that online sweat test and the uh, 10 simple questions in that, uh, that you will answer about how you typically sweat during training. So go and take that test. And then if you want to try Precision Hydration's electrolyte products that you can match to your uh, sweat sodium concentration, then you can get 15% off your order with the promo code that Triathlon Show 15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roca that you can find on roca.com. Roca are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And they are trusted by some of the world's best athletes, including triathletes such as Lucy Charles Barclay, Flora Duffy, Katie Safiris, Javier Gomez, uh, Mario Mola, and many, many others. You can get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. One thing that I should mention before we get into the interview is that uh, my microphone uh, didn't uh, play nice with me for when we were conducting this interview. It actually uh, cho- chose not to connect and in the end it turned out that it was a USB port that wasn't working properly. Uh, so it's fixed now that I'm recording this intro and outro. But uh, for the interview itself, uh, I'm using the built-in computer microphone, which isn't great sound quality. Uh, uh, Grégoire has a better sound quality on his end with his computer. But anyway, apologies for that. It should only be this interview because I managed to solve the issue uh, very soon after conducting this interview. But again, apologies for the less than ideal sound quality on my end. Now let's jump into that interview with Professor Grégoire Millet. Welcome, Grégoire, to that triathlon show. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Yeah, I'm very pleased to speak with you. It's uh, great to have you. Uh, you're somebody who has published a lot of uh, research relevant to endurance athletes through the years. And whenever we, you read books like, uh, for example, uh, books that uh, that uh, cite a lot of science and you go to the references it's uh, amazing how often your name pops up there so uh, so it's really great to have you on and let's start with the main topic for today which is uh, altitude training which you have done a lot of research in can you start by just describing physiologically what happens when we are training and racing at altitude compared to 
what it's like at sea level or yeah yeah historically altitude training was only uh spending three or four weeks in the real mountain you know like uh, it started before the uh mexico olympic games in uh, 1968 so this method where you live and train high is called live high train high so we will first uh, discuss i guess this way of using altitude training and then the main um, goal the main outcome is to improve the oxygen transport capacity this oxygen transport capacity comes from the improvement in the convective factor the way Uh, hemoglobin will transport the oxygen from the lung to the to the muscle to the mitochondria uh, and uh, one of the most important uh, parameter then is uh, the increase in the total hemoglobin mass and we will discuss that a bit because uh, hemoglobin mass you can get it from uh, uh, like a a uh, classic uh, blood sample uh, and most of the time you will only have the hemoglobin concentration while uh, it is much better to measure the total hemoglobin mass in the body. Um, so how does it work? How can we really increase the total hemoglobin mass? It, it starts from the respiratory function. When you will uh, uh, travel to the mountain, the barometric pressure is reduced. Even at the top of Mount Everest, you will have 20.93% of oxygen in the air. So it's not uh, the point to have less um, oxygen. It is, uh, the point is that it is more difficult to use it. And it is more difficult to use it because due to the decreased barometric pressure, the oxygen pressure in the ambient air is reduced then um, the oxygen pressure in the alveola, in the blood, and at all the different steps of the oxygen cascade will be reduced. And what happens when you go to the mountain is you will try to uh, reduce the decrease due to the um, lower oxygen pressure in the, in the air. And how do you do that? you will start to overbreathe. And since you overbreathe, first, it is a good sign. It shows that you are able to detect that you are in an hypoxic environment. Secondly, it will have a lot of consequences. If I can try, if I can try to explain briefly what happened, when I will overbreathe, my uh, breathing frequency, my respiratory rate will increase and it will induce a lot of CO2 release. I will exhale a lot of CO2. I will overbreathe because it's a way to mechanically increase the pressure in my alveola. Like if you pump in a, in a balloon, you know, you will pump in a balloon. So the pressure in the balloon will increase. If I overbreathe, it will increase the pressure in the alveola that will make potentially the diffusion of the oxygen from the alveola to the Um, capillary uh, a bit a bit easier, but since I overbreathe, I will exhale a lot of CO2 that will induce what we call the hypocapnia, a reduction in the CO2 concentration in the blood. So the acid-base balance in the blood will change, and then later on, after a few days, it will. Uh, make uh, the blood concentration, the blood uh, composition a bit different. And one of the most important things is that this hypocapnia uh, will change the cerebral blood flow, the cerebral perfusion. So that explains partly that um, altitude is not a reduction in oxygen in the, in the body. It's also due to this hyperventilation mechanism, it's also a reduction in the CO2 in the body. So you have hypocapnia, and at the blood level, we are talking about hypoxemia, and we have, hypo we have um, yes, hypoxia, and at the blood level, it's hypoxemia, and you have hypocapnia. So let's talk about the effect of this hypocapnia. 
This, yeah, apoc- this yeah, I- just make, make, to make one note here quickly for the listeners yes. that may not be aware, the alveoli that you're referring to, that's where the diffusion of, uh, of oxygen between the lungs and the capillaries occur. So they're part of the, of the lungs, essentially. Exactly. So just to give you a number, at the at sea level in Normoxia, the ambient air PO2 is about 150 millimeters of mercury. And then at the uh, arterial level, the, the, the PAO2, the arterial pressure of oxygen, is 100. So if you go to the Mount Everest, in the ambient air, it will be something like a third. Instead of having 150, you will have something like 50 millimeters of mercury. And then you can easily understand that it will, be, it will be much more difficult for this pressure of oxygen to have the diffusion and to get this oxygen in the blood. And the oxygen is, is transported, binded to the hemoglobin. But I would like also to explain that um, if you have this hypocapnia, the acid-base balance will change. That means you will need less bicarbonate in your blood. And then you will, you will um, decrease the bicarbonate by uh, what we call the diuresis, an increase in the urine, urine um, release. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's exactly the, the right term, but diuresis, it means you will in some way pee much more. So for the coaches, it's quite interesting to see that he has already few ways to observe if an athlete has a good chemosensitivity, a good way to, for his body to detect hypoxia or not. One first expected response is overbreathing, hyperventilation. Another way uh, he could observe is his athletes has a good chemosensitivity is by uh, the um, their need of going much more often during the first week to the toilet for um, uh, due to the uh, the need to 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 pee. Uh, secondly, uh, it will. Um, so you will have a decrease in the arterial pressure in oxygen, and this arterial pressure of oxygen then will make the aerobic performance uh, much less effective. It is uh, of interest to observe that at every stage of the oxygen cascade, then you have some adaptive uh, responses, adaptive uh, mechanisms. And for that, uh, it, uh, what we call acclimatization. The acclimatization process really is required if you want to minimize the detrimental effect of altitude and if you want to optimize the benefits that you expect post-altitude training camp. So, so can, you, can, you, can you explain the performance decrease in terms of the, uh, the arterial uh, pressure of, of oxygen uh, a bit more? Is, is it simply a factor of or for the reason that uh, that it's more difficult for uh, the oxygen to diffuse across the uh, the alveoli uh, to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells or are there some other factors going on there as well uh well the main fa- the main factor is uh this uh, decreased uh, convective convection that means you have less oxygen that will diffuse to the to the capillary that uh, that is perfusing the alveoli then instead of having 100 millimeter of mercury, that is the, let's say, normal way in normoxia, you will have a, a lower value. That's what we call hypoxemia. So instead of having 100 at the lung level, you, if you are about uh, 2,500 uh, meter of altitude, you will have something like 60 millimeter of mercury. In yep as arterial pressure and the lowest value ever measured has been measured by one of the, one British team at the just below the top of Mount Everest. It was something like 20 millimeter of mercury as arterial pressure in oxygen. 
So you can imagine how difficult it is then to do any, uh, any movement. So what is, what is important is to understand also that oxygen is mainly transported by the blood when bind to hemoglobin. It is a form of, of hemoglobin that we call oxyhemoglobin, O2HB, and this oxyhemoglobin is um, a very important factor uh, to check. So it is high in the lung and it will be less in the muscle because oxygen then will diffuse, the second diffus diffusive factor will diffuse from the capillary in the muscles to the mitochondria. And mitochondria, as you might know, is somewhere a small factory that will um, use oxygen and substrate, for example, uh, glucose, to uh, uh, give to the muscle uh, this currency that we call ATP. So mitochondria should, uh, has to be seen as a way to transport, to transform some chemical energy, oxygen, uh, lipid, uh, glucose, and so on, to uh, something that will be uh, used by the muscle to produce uh, biomechanical energy, mechanical energy. And as you might know, the, the ratio mechanical energy uh, over chemical energy is called efficiency. And what we know is that altitude does not modify efficiency in human muscle. So that means the decrease in aerobic performance is strongly related to the decrease in VO2 max and the decrease in VO2 max is strongly related to the hemoglobin uh, concentration. So it's a very important parameter. Yes. And how does it then adapt to, to altitude training? So, so if you talk about what are the changes that we then see when we have adapted to altitude and maybe go down to sea level to race, what, what's the difference then? So the, the best way to, to check if an altitude training camp has been effective is by measuring the total hemoglobin mass. So it is by using some technique that have been developed by a, one a German colleague uh, Walter Schmidt, and uh, this method is called optimized CO rebreathing uh, technique. So you will, uh, from that, not measure only the hemoglobin concentration, but the total mass of hemoglobin in the body. Let's say for somebody who is healthy, but not so much trained, his VO2 max for a male will be between 40 and 45, all right? Is total hemoglobin mass for somebody uh, who's about 70 kilo will be between 700 to 800 gram. Now, let's speak about a top uh, endurance athlete. The highest value comes from Kilian Jornet, 92. Uh, just after uh, my uh, Norwegian colleague published another value with a, a Norwegian cyclist who has been a junior world champion. He was 95, if I remember well. So 92 is about twice the value of a healthy adult. And then the total hemoglobin mass in these uh, champions is about twice the value of what is seen in a healthy adults. So instead of having seven to 800 gram of hemoglobin, these guys, they might have up to 1.5 kilo, 1.6 kilo in their body. And then coming back to the effectiveness of altitude training, one of the best way is to measure this total hemoglobin mass. And then we do expect about 100% increase in your total hemoglobin mass for every 100 hour spent in altitude. 100 hour of exposure at altitude is likely to lead to 1% increase in hemoglobin mass. If everything is done correctly, if the altitude is also optimal. Can and I then, uh, sorry, 
So, sorry, sorry, go on. I think you were just going on to it. So, so can you describe what is optimal altitude? And then also, what are the typical magnitudes that you can see if, if everything is, is done right? How, how many percentage in total would you expect to, to see until you can't get any better effects, really? So we are still talking about the living high, training high methods. So um, if you spend about three weeks, you can expect, in, uh, including in uh, very top uh, athletes, up to 3% to 4% increase in your total hemoglobin mass. And for that, it has to be the, at the optimal altitude. We do recommend that they sleep and train around 2,300, 2,500. One of the issues, if you sleep too high, is that uh, the quality of your sleep is really decreased. You know, you have a periodic breathing, you have a hypopnea, hypnea, and then you will desaturate during the sleep. That means the recovery um, will be affected and the outcome post-altitude training camp uh, is likely then to be damaged. If you sleep at 2,500, then you are exactly at the right altitude based on this oxyhemoglobin curve that I did explain before. And you are likely to be uh, slightly below 60 millimeter of mercury in arterial pressure of oxygen. And then it's, it is also an altitude where the quality of the training can be maintained. So uh, if I do summarize, uh, you do expect to have at least 2% of uh, total hemoglobin mass increase. That is to spend the minimum 18 days, but optimally three to four weeks. And you have to stay, you, you sleep and you train uh, between 2003 up to 2005 the athletes who are very, very uh, experienced and acclimatized or the athletes who, uh, who comes from uh, like a mountain region who have uh, their un uh, ancestry, you say that? Ancestry uh, also, so they are very well adapted for genetic region, for genetic reason, then you can expect them also to be effective uh, a slightly higher altitude. But we don't recommend for any athletes to train and to uh, sleep above 3,000 meters. Mm. And how does the 2 or 3% increase in total hemoglobin mass relate to potential performance improvement? You mentioned that it is it almost linear to VO2 max improvement, so you can expect also a 2 to 3% improvement in VO2 max, and uh, then performance might potentially be similar or maybe a bit less? Or do, you, uh, do you have any data on, on how hemoglobin yeah. relates to performance? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So as you know, endurance performance is not only, is not only uh, induced by VO2 max. You have three, three main parameters. The first one is VO2 max that is improved post-altitude due to this polyglobuli, poly, uh, so increase in total hemoglobin mass. You, we have also to make sure that uh, altitude is not detrimental for the second factor, that is uh, economy or efficiency. Economy is one of the most important factors in distance running, and that's, what, that's the reason why the uh, East African athletes are so successful in uh, long distance running, because they are likely to be more economical. I, I mean by that, that the energy per uh, kilo of body mass divided by unit of distance is lower. They are more economical. They will use less fuel per unit of distance. And altitude, one of the good points is that, again, if you do everything right, altitude is likely to improve a VO2 max, but also to improve economy. Improving economy means reducing the running energy cost. You know, the running energy cost, you express running energy cost in, a, in a joule per kilo per meter, but very often we use milliliter of oxygen per kilo of body mass per kilometer. And somebody like uh, um, 
let's say, uh, Paula Radcliffe. She had a value about 170. And the best human uh, ever measured are from Eritrea or from uh, Ethiopia. And they, the men, they can have a value lower than 160 milliliter of oxygen per kilo per kilometer. That is extremely uh, low value for running energy cost, very uh, good economy. So altitude, if altitude was supposed to improve VO2 max, but at the same rate would be detrimental to economy, there would be no benefits to go to altitude. You would improve your VO2 max. It's more or less uh, to the same percent that your increase in hemoglobin mass, right? But if the running economy is uh, damaged, then you would not benefit from uh, your VO2 max improvement. You would have no translation in terms of velocity. By chance, if you do everything right, you can improve VO2 max and also improve economy. Mm, so, that, is, that is very interesting. That, that they call. So just uh, just uh, one, one of the things I would like to, to mention is that uh, Altitude is uh, something uh, quite difficult to, to handle for the coaches. They have to make sure the athletes will train at the right velocity, at the right intensity. If you don't have experience uh, but with previous altitude training camp, you can use a very simple matrix that most of the, most of the athletes, they will decrease the at altitude, they will decrease VO2 max uh, from 6 to 7% for every 1,000 meter. That means if you are at 2,000, it will be something like 15% decreased in VO2 max. That has to translate to a lower running velocity or power output in cycling. If you train too intense, too fast, during the altitude training camp, and especially during the acclimatization phase, then it is very likely that the benefits in terms of your increased hemoglobin mass and improved VO2 max post-altitude will be much lower. So let's, let's talk a bit about the, the training to do when at altitude. And uh, so you said that ideally, well, you want at least 18 days, but ideally three to four weeks. Uh, so how long should the quote unquote adaptation period be and what type of training should you be doing then? And at what point might you start to do a bit more uh, intense training, if any? What, what's your general recommendations, both from a scientific, but also maybe from a just practical coaching perspective? Yeah, it's, it is a very important question. For me, it's probably the, the key question. Uh, you need to maintain uh, aerobic training during the whole acclimatization phase. So the acclimatization phase can be only a few days for the athletes who are going very regularly to altitude, but it can be up to eight to 10 days in the athletes less experience or who have um, who are uh, responding uh, less easily to altitude. And so at least for five days, but sometimes up to 10 days, you have to uh, prescribe only low intensity training plus strength plus sprint. So strength and sprint is to maintain the neuromuscular quality, the explosivity, you know, to maintain the, the capacity to... Uh, to accelerate on a very short period of time. But all the, uh, let's say, long training has to be well managed, well controlled to make sure that the athletes stay only in the moderate intensity domain. And the moderate intensity domain is below the first threshold, lactic threshold or ventilatory threshold. It is very, very important. Keep in mind that the hemoglobin mass increase starts from uh, this uh, ventilatory adaptation that I did describe, this hyperventilation mechanisms. But 
the uh, erythropoietic responses, the production by the kidney of erythropo erythropoietin that leads to production of erythrocyte and then to increase in hemoglobin mass in red cell volume. Uh, this uh, erythropoietic uh, adaptation or response can be blunt if the, if the training is too intense. Acidosis is likely to blunt the erythropo erythropoietic responses at altitude. So during the acclimatization phase, you know, during this period uh, for some athletes, five days, for some up to 10 days, you have to make sure that the respiratory acclimatization is going well, is, is uh, developing, and that the erythropoietic responses is effective. And then later on, week two, week three, week four, progressively, you can start to do more intense training like fart leg, interval training, repeated spring training, whatever. But it's very, very important that, uh, again, you know, that's my main uh, recommendation during the altitude training camp to make sure the training intensity is well controlled and well understood by the athletes. It is something that is not new. Huh? I did, uh, uh, one of my students, Raphael, found some uh, uh, TV program of 1966 uh, on the Swiss TV. And uh, already in 1966, the medical doctor of the National Training Center in Switzerland was um, explaining that it's very difficult for the athletes to understand that they have to train at a lower velocity, at a lower intensity because of the altitude. Yeah. And when you have, is there a way to to know when your acclimatization period is is good enough? Or can you do some sort of measurements to, to determine that, okay, now you can start to introduce a little bit of intensity in your training? Yeah, it's a very, very important question. Uh, thank you for that. Obviously, um, the best way to check the end of the acclimatization period is to monitor the blood gases and to or to, and or to monitor the saturation. You can use oximeter, you know, it's a small piece of equipment that you can have at the finger or at the earlobe, and it will give you a number. At sea level, it's 98%. What does it mean, 98%? That means 98% of the oxygen transported by the, in the blood compartment is binded, is binded on uh, hemoglobin. Only 2% uh, is transported in another way. And 98%, the saturation, then obviously the value will decrease. And during the first week, you expect, uh, for example, the sleeping saturation value to progressively increase day after day. So we have experience where if you go, for example, to 2,500, instead of sleeping at 98% of saturation, you might have some athletes, they will desaturate uh, down to 88, 87. And then you expect every day that progressively they increase their saturation. If from day one to day two, they move up from 87 to 88. Okay, that's fine. If you start too intense training too early, it's likely that the following night, saturation will decrease again. So saturation is probably the easiest and uh, most interesting parameter to be measured in altitude. You need to check that the acclimatization process is really uh, effective, is, is really occurring by looking for a progressive increase in this saturation. Um, and then, obviously, you will never reach again the 98% the value that you will find at sea level. After a few days, maybe the athletes will start to stabilize at 93, 94, and then it is the first indication that probably you can, you can start some uh, intense, more intense training. The so second point, very important to be monitored, is the hydration level. Remember, I did explain that the hyper, 
ventilation uh, process was leading to a diuresis crisis. The, the fact that you are uh, uh, peeing urine, you have the uh, urine release much higher. It's a good sign of adaptation, but then it, in you, it, it is inducing that the risk of dehydration is higher. And keep in mind also that since you will hyperventilate, you will release a lot of uh, water by the breathing with uh, uh, water vapor. So you are losing water by two way to a much higher rate than uh, at sea level. So you have to check the hydration. In our studies and in training camp, you have different ways. It can be urine uh, specific gravity to use a refractometer and then you check the urine gravity. It can be by using like a bioimpedance a system that will give to you the value in uh, intracellular, extracellular water. Uh, it can be simply by weighting the athletes every morning to make sure that they don't have a large drop from day one to day two. It can be by using some uh, like color strip, whatever. It is uh, more or less sophisticated, but uh, definitely my second advice is check the hydration of your athletes at least and daily, very accurately during this acclimatization phase. It is important that they don't get uh, dehydrated. If not, again, the acclimatization process can be blunted. The, the third point, the third uh, way we use uh, during altitude training is to use heart rate variability. So you can uh, have the athletes to perform a small test in the morning supine and standing and from that you will check uh, the acclimatization by looking to the sympathetic versus parasympathetic balance of the autonomous nervous system responses you know and this uh, it's a bit complicated to explain uh, just uh, like that in during a podcast but we have some good way to assess the sympathetic parasympathetic balance and you can see if something gets wrong, then you can adapt the altitude. If you sleep in, a, in an hypoxic chamber, it's easier, but then you can reduce the altitude. If you are in a real altitude training camp, it's more tricky. That would mean that you change the altitude of your, um, of your location, of your residence, you know, to go a bit lower. So yeah. to summarize in terms of, to summarize in terms of monitoring, uh, this uh, acclimatization phase, I would recommend just to use heart rate variability, any way to uh, ac accurately measure hydration and very compulsory to use saturation and obviously heart rate. Got it. And, and when we have successfully completed an adaptation period, and things are looking good with the monitoring. Can what can the load be in as we resume more normal training? Would you be okay? Let's say an athlete, a triathlete, is used to doing uh, four, or five high intensity workouts per week. Would they be able to do the same, but just adjust the intensity down? Of course, because as you mentioned, sixty-seven percent a decrease in VO2 max per 1,000 meters of altitude. But with the amount of intensity, is, is it possible to do the same amount and the same amount of volume and mm -hmm. load? Or what's your advice around that? Yeah, volume is not a problem. You can maintain very high volume in altitude as long as you have enough uh, uh, water, you know, enough drink, and you're sure that also you, you, are, you have a higher uh, glucide intake because altitude is also modifying the oxidation of the different substrate, less fat, more sugar, more glucose. So you have also to change the nutrition to make sure they have enough glycogen. The risk of um, hypoglycemia is higher in altitude. But let's say if you, if you do that well, it's not a problem. The athletes train very long, very, very long hours and, uh, uh, high volume in altitude, you know, if you want to prepare Hawaii, you need a high volume of, uh, of training anyway. 
for the intensity, as I did explain, if you if you use the six seven percent for every one thousand meter, it is the acute responses. After the acclimatization, uh, you will bit by bit uh, be able to increase the the intensity of training. It will never come back to the sea level uh, value, right? But after six to uh, eight days, it's possible then it, instead of, let's say, 15% at 2,000 meters of altitude, you can uh, uh, compensate this decrease by one third. So it can be, uh, like, instead of 15%, it could be, uh, let's say, 9%. Mm. And then from that, you can calculate your pace and progressively, even at the end of the three weeks training camp, it has to be at least lower by 5%. Yeah. I, I am clear or? Yes. Just one follow-up question. Can you, would you recommend, is it possible to do a similar amount of intense training as uh, you do at sea level, even though the intensity is still a little bit lower, but can you do the same amount? So again, if you are used to doing five intense sessions for a triathlete, which could be quite normal uh, for an elite triathlete, would you still do five intense sessions of a similar type at altitude? Ah. Yeah, I think you have to be very uh, prudent, very cautious that uh, because of the higher rate of uh, glycogen uh, use, uh, it's likely uh, that uh, if you do too often high intensity training, interval training, in swimming, in cycling, in running, it's likely that uh, the muscle recovery uh, will be less uh, or will be lowered compared to sea level. So I would recommend that you have more time between two interval training sessions. And also that during the session, you use a little bit longer recovery. The reason to use longer recovery between uh, reps is that the heart rate increase and, and especially during recovery, the heart rate decrease and the VO2 decrease, what we call the off VO2 kinetics is slower in altitude. So if you want to come back to the resting value, it will take you longer in altitude. That's why if you want to do like interval training, we do recommend longer uh, recovery. So yeah. you have to adapt the intensity of your uh, interval training in the work interval, and you have to adapt mainly the length of the recovery, the recovery interval. So that's why it's, um, you know, and everything is obviously uh, uh, different from one athlete to the other one. The one who's, who's adapting well and the one who, who will need a lower altitude or longer time to acclimatize, then you have to prescribe the interval training session after the acclimatization phase in a different way. Yeah, that's good advice. So speaking of uh, the individual variation in how you adapt, what is that variation? Uh, can everybody get some positive benefits from altitude training or are there things or are there people that are non-responders? What's your take on that? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the concept of responder and non-responder is uh, very tricky. My view is that for anything, you are non-responder to uh, because a uh, stimulus is wrong for you. Let's take an example. If you have a too low level of ferritin of, of uh, iron, ser uh, seric iron in your, in your blood when you arrive at altitude, whatever you do there, it will not work for you. The erythropoietic responses, the fact that your kidney will produce EPO and then uh, that will lead to the increase in your hemoglobin mass, that request uh, to have iron in your, in your blood. So people can go to altitude, they can do everything right, but since you forgot to check the iron level, you might uh, guess, oh, he's a bad responder, he's a non-responder to altitude. The next time you check the ferritin and then for the same type of training, the same organization, it could work for him. The other issue is uh, the question of the altitude severity. If you need a lower altitude because you are already hypoxemic at sea level, hypoxemic at sea level means that 
at the end of the VO2 max test, your arterial pressure in oxygen is already severely decreased. You know, it can be down to 70 millimeter of mercury in some athletes at sea level. Or if you check the saturation at the end of a VO2 max test, most of the people will desaturate a little bit from 98 to let's say 95, 96 at sea level. But most of the uh, uh, big uh, proportion of the endurance, elite endurance athletes will be hypoxemic. They will have a large drop in their saturation down to 88 some for, for some of them. So if you are already desaturating a lot at sea level, guess that what will happen at altitude. It's probably that you need a lower altitude that compared to your counterpart um, colleague uh, who is desaturating less. So we have many, many way, many parameters to, to check if we want to be sure that uh, the guy is not responding to altitude. So to be honest, I don't think that um, uh, there is really non-responder to altitude. I think right. simply that uh, either uh, the altitude training camp was not well monitored, well prescribed. Many mistakes have been done. You know, dehydration, iron, nutrition, intensity, recovery, and so on and so on. Or either that the... Um, or either that there is a stimulus by itself, the so severity of altitude or the length of the exposure was not uh, adapted. It can be too low or it can be too high. It's like a medication, you know, if you have a headache and you need two pills, if I give you half a pills, it will not work, then altitude is too low. But if, you, if I give you 10 pills, you, it's not uh, satisfying. So you will have a stomach pain and you, st you will probably still have the headache. So um, in fr uh, how can I translate that in English? Uh, medication, uh, the dose makes the poison, right? Yeah. Altitude exactly the same. The dose makes the poison. Too high is detrimental. Too low is not effective. And it has to be high it, you, you have to, to check if it's high enough or low enough uh, for any athletes based on his experience. His chemosensitivity means uh, his body, uh, is it able to detect altitude? You know, that's why I do emphasize uh, the need to observe the behavior of your athletes. Uh, one athlete who's not over-breathing, one, one athlete who's not going to the toilet very often during the first days, it's likely that he didn't start the acclimatization process. So it's likely that post-altitude, he won't get the same benefits than the people who have this high chemosensitivity. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. And how long can the adaptations that we get from altitude training last? And also, what does that mean in terms of when should you go back to, uh, to sea level if you're racing at sea level after an altitude training camp? Yeah, it's, uh, it's another very tricky point. You know, for long, uh, studies have been conducted only to monitor what's going on during the altitude training camp. Uh, very few uh, studies have been performed post-altitude. So Rob Chapman, uh, who is a colleague uh, working in USA, and he is still, uh, I guess, the, the scientific advisor for USA Track and Field, very knowledgeable about altitude training, he published a few papers about the kinetics of the adaptation post-altitude. So you're likely to have, at least for some of the athletes, a first window of few days post-altitude where it's possible to get a very good performance. You know, just day, day two, day three, post-altitude. But often it's not possible to use this window for logistical reason. You know, if you, are, if you have to travel, if you have to do heat acclimatization and so on, very difficult. Uh, then it's likely also that you have a period where it is, uh, uh, where uh, bad performance may occur. Again, you have some, expect some exception. Some athletes can have their PB at day eight or day 10 post altitude. But for most of us, it's unlikely that you will get a good, uh, good performance between day five and day 12, you know, 
roughly. And then the most secure period to benefit from the altitude adaptation is uh, after two weeks or after four, three weeks. So from day 14 to day uh, 28, then you have like a plateau. In, during this plateau, so two weeks to three, four weeks post altitude, you will get the benefits of this uh, hematological, hematological adaptation, this HB mass erythropoietic responses. You will still have the uh, adaptation about your uh, respiratory muscle, respiratory mechanic, mechanics, and it's likely that you will get an improvement in your economy. So you will have improvement during uh, this plateau, post two weeks, post three weeks, up to post four weeks, uh, in your VO2 max and in your economy. That means it's likely that for a distance runner or a triathlete, likely that you will get good performances. Perfect. The, re the reason, the reason uh, why uh, you have less chance to have good performance, uh, let's say at day seven to day, day five to day 12, you know, uh, it has been speculated that uh, post-altitude, you need to readapt your uh, breathing, you need to readapt your gait, your running mechanics, and you have to wait a little bit longer to make sure you get the full benefits of the hematological adaptation. So uh, Rob Chapman was uh, talking about uh, hematological uh, hypothesis, biomechanical hypothesis, and ventilatory hypothesis. By chance, this summer, uh, we had the opportunity to test on the instrumented treadmill, treadmill with force plate, the running mechanics of 10 uh, young Swiss middle distance runners uh, just before they went to Saint Moritz. Saint Moritz is 1850 meter of altitude. You know, it's a very um, good spot for altitude training. A lot of uh, distance runners are going there. So we, we did measure the running mechanics of these athletes uh, immediately before the, the altitude training camp and immediately after. The idea was to check if, as speculated, as expected, altitude training would be detrimental for your running mechanics. Uh, for example, uh, det uh, detrimental running mechanics would mean a longer contact time uh, higher vertical oscillation of your uh, center of mass, uh, lower uh, leg stiffness, you know. Uh, it's, we are not talking about uh, metabolic responses. We are talking only about uh, uh, mechanics of running. And the principle that was uh, underlying this hypothesis of a detrimental effect of altitude on the running mechanics is simply that if I spend three weeks running in altitude and due to the lower VO2 max, and as I did explain before, the need of a lower uh, running velocity, I might have an effect on the running mechanics. My running mechanics then would need to be retrained, readapt during this five to 12 days uh, where the performance uh, likelihood is, is, is uh, reduced. So we tested this biomechanics, biomechanical hypothesis and uh, contradictory to our hypothesis uh, and to the general assumption in the altitude training world, we did not observe any change post three weeks of running at altitude. That means, in other words, that it's still very uh, unclear why the likelihood to get good performance between this negative phase, day five to day 12, why uh, does it occur, you know? Uh, but, but for sure, it will not occur because altitude training was detrimental to your running biomechanics. Because we did, the paper is, uh, uh, will be released uh, very soon. To explain this uh, this point. Okay, yeah, that's that's really interesting to hear that there's a new a new science about that, and and also you mentioned at the beginning of this interview about uh, 
uh, including some sprints in your training just for that neuromuscular and I guess potentially even biomechanical uh, aspects of, of maintaining maintaining some of that. Uh, so yeah, maybe- just, you know, uh, another wrong assumption that was also sometimes main, uh, uh, proposed for altitude training was that altitude training by itself would lead to a reduction in your uh, cross-section area, in your muscle volume or muscle mass. It is true that extremely high dose of altitude, let's say if you spend 100 days at 3,000 meters, or if you spend a month at 6,000 meters, it is true that it might induce uh, some uh, muscle waste, um, you know, muscle mass loss. Mm. But we are talking about altitude up to 3,000 meters and up to four weeks. That means, uh, and some colleague from Belgium had a very good uh, uh, study about that, uh, Louis Deldic, they showed that the hypoxic dose that would lead to this detrimental effect in terms of muscle mass and then consequently in terms of power and explosivity uh, is by far um, larger than what we do recommend for the athletes. But uh, since you can't do any interval training during the acclimatization phase, then we do recommend that you do some sprint, some strength to maintain the neuromuscular function. Yeah. And uh, so we have primarily discussed uh, living high and training high, but what about living high and training low? Uh, Can you talk about the difference uh, of that protocol? Yeah, living high, training low is a very good example of uh, some uh, of uh, scientists coming on board with some ID. And I'm talking uh, uh, of uh, Benjamin, Professor Benjamin Ledin and uh, Dr. James Trengenossen. They, in 92, uh, and then the first paper published was 97, they did assume that if I spend uh, long enough at altitude, I will have these erythropoietic responses. But in the same time, if I train a bit lower, I will have a better training quality. So the potential reduction in velocity that was assumed to be detrimental if you train high would be lower because you can maintain your uh, running velocity uh, since you train at a lower altitude. The first study was performed be- between Park City and Salt Lake City. So it was between 2,300 and uh, 12,300. So we have to keep in mind that uh, this study was not co- coming back to sea level. It was still training at moderate altitude, at a lower altitude than the altitude uh, the athletes slept. And uh, to be honest, um, this um, study, and uh, I know Ben and I know Jim, uh, obviously they've done a very good, very good work. And uh, this idea of trying to combining the hypoxic dose by sleeping high and the better uh, training quality by training low is very interesting. Um, the, the point is that uh, it has changed the way most of the athletes around the world now train in altitude. The living high training low methods has been assumed to be the gold standard methods for very long. Personally, I'm not so sure that leave high, train low is much better than leave high, train high for endurance athletes. I think that the athletes should combine some phase where they play with only this uh, hematological adaptation, leave high, train high, and some phase where they need higher training quality, maybe just in the pre-competition period, where they can use more leave high, train low. It's possible to do both also during the same training camp, you know, if you live in, uh, if you stay in uh, Font Romeu, for example, you have the track at 1850, but you can also drive down to the valley and then you can train at 1000 meters. So you can do Levi train high for some period and then combine with Levi train low. Uh, 
What I do recommend now is to do leave high, train low and high. It is a method that is to combine leave high, train low and training high. And this method is very, very interesting since you can really combine, let's say, the classical uh, methods, leave high, train high, leave high, train low, that are dedicated to the endurance athletes. You can combine that with a new training method that has been developed in my lab, and it is repeated spring training in hypoxia. And this repeated spring training in hypoxia uh, is about doing very high intensity training as high as possible. And it is used now by uh, cyclists, it is used by triathletes. So maybe you want to know more about this RSH, repeated spring training and hypoxia? Absolutely. Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk a bit more about that. You know, I was reading in uh, one of the French uh, cycling uh, journal recently that uh, Pocaccia was uh, mentioning that he was now using RSH. Uh, I know that the French cyclists, they used RSH. It is a, a method that has nothing to do with the erythropoietic responses. It is a method that will only improve your muscle ability to resist to fatigue, and especially to intermittent fatigue, you know, like repeated sprint. It is something we have developed in our lab that is also now used by the rugby player, football player, and so on and so on. So if I do a repeated sprint in hypoxia, I will have a very special mechanism that will occur. I will recruit fast twitch fibers because I'm sprinting and the power output is very high. And in the same time, since it is in high altitude, I will induce a very large deoxygenation of the muscle. This deoxygenation will uh, lead to a vasodilatory compensation, compensatory mechanisms. Because I have less oxygen in my capillary and I need to provide the oxygen to the muscle at maximal intensity, my uh, microcirculation will uh, uh, make possible to have these acute vasodilatory compensation mechanisms. And by itself, these uh, mechanisms, meaning you have more blood coming to your muscles, that means more oxygen, more substrate that could explain why you can sustain more sprint and or, or have a lower effect of fatigue during this intermittent maximal exercise. So guess now for a triathlete. If you are a, a triathlete, is the pacing uh, even? For sure, in swimming, it's not the case. You have to reaccelerate every turn, you know, after the boy, you, after the boy, uh, you have to reaccelerate. Uh, in cycling, it is not the case, especially over the short distance. It is a very erratic pace, attack, uh, staying in the bunch, attacking, and so on. And even in running now, it is very important that you have the, this acceleration capacity. So this acceleration capacity, the fact that you can accelerate one, two, three times in a row, can be improved by RSH. And... Uh, I can uh, I I would recommend the your your audience to find the publication about that uh, and then I come to the new training method living high training low and high you know if yes. I and just, stay just high to, sorry I'll, I'll put the link to your paper on RS, RSH in the show notes so that the listeners will be able to find it easily okay thank you yeah so it is a method. Uh, we published the first paper in 2013. Uh, I did have the, this idea when I was in Qatar between 2004 and 2008. But uh, at that time, we didn't have the opportunity to run uh, proper studies. And I had to wait to come back to Lausanne, uh, where I am now, at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, to run uh, these uh, studies. And the first paper was published by one of my ex-PhD students, Raphael Face, in 2013. And it is of interest to see that now you have many sports and many teams who are uh, performing this type of method. Uh, in team sports, obviously, because repeated sprint ability is of interest in team sports, you know, if you are in racket sports, but also more and more 
combined with the classical methods in endurance sports because there's no even pace in uh, in real world. You need the light, you know. I, I was watching uh, Chip the guy uh, a few days ago. You need the light to have an even pace. In the real world, during uh, like a championship race, it is really an even. You have yeah. to accelerate, decelerate, and reaccelerate very often. And in triathlon, it's even more the case, with the, especially during the biking part. So you live high, you train low. That means you've got the erythropoietic uh, benefits uh, living high. You've got the quality of training, training low. And in the same times, two or three times a week, you stay high and it can be done. Even the first week during the acclimatization phase, you do short sets of RSH. It means six to 10 seconds sprinting sets very short uh, a session and uh, you have to keep the quality. If you want to recruit the fast switch fibers, you have to keep the quality during the, the training set. What would the set look like? How many sprints and how long recoveries and how many sets? So for the, let's, let's, let's talk about uh, short distance triathletes, like Olympic distance triathletes. Yeah. Uh, I would recommend it should be three to four sets of four to six sprint of 10 seconds with 15 to 20 seconds of recovery. You know, it's very short. Yeah. You can do that on the turbo, on the bike. You can do that uphill in running, whatever. You know, you can do that in swimming if the swimming pool is high enough. And it doesn't affect the way that you will train. If you keep training at altitude, the uh, aerobic session, I keep the recommendation below the first threshold. If you are, uh, if you are um, uh, Ironman, so obviously you can do more repeated spring training combined to the low intensity training, but uh, the justification is a bit lower because on Ironman, the need of uh, resisting to acceleration is, is less obvious. Just some critical moment during the race you would require uh, this ability to accelerate. Yeah. And uh, one other thing that I would like to ask about is for people that are living at altitudes year round. So people that are living in, for example, uh, in Park City or in Boulder, Colorado or other places where you have that the kind of altitude that we're talking about, how does that impact, does it impact how they should be training uh, and adjust training potentially? Yeah, of course, because they will. Uh, because if they spend year long, uh, year round uh, in altitude, they will be acclimatized. But one of the risks is to have a, a quality of training that will be damaged. So I would recommend even for these people for them to do low intent, low altitude training camp. You know, yeah, it's a, uh, it's more or less the way the East African runners are doing now. They spend uh, most of their time during the preparation period in, uh, in Eton. I've, I was lucky to be in Eton, in Eton, uh, Kenya, when I was with Qatar. And, uh, but they have to come to low altitude for competition on a regular basis. And I think it's part of the reason they are so, so successful. They have this large base uh, training in altitude, but also they can come to sea level to do more intense training. And uh, I would not recommend, for example, to uh, have permanent altitude training in, in altitude. Yeah. It would, I, I think at, at one point, the benefits of that can be counterbalanced by, uh, it, I, don't, I, I don't mean that it would be detrimental, but I mean that the benefits will be at the end uh, very low. Yeah. And, and if you are living at altitude and you have a sea level race that you're going to, should you also then keep in mind that those windows of opportunity, either race in the very first few days or uh, stay at sea level for 12 plus days before you race so that you don't have that window? Yeah, that would be my recommendation uh, to do the tapering at a sea level. And then including in the tapering, obviously you have less uh, high intensity session 
but you can make sure the high intensity session at sea level. That means if everything goes well, the power output can be quite high. Yeah. And another topic, but perhaps the final one on altitude is uh, what's your opinion on altitude tents and, uh, and chambers and masks and other stuff that we can use at sea level? Yeah, it's a very important topic. We've, we, we did conduct some study to compare hyperbaric hypoxia, that's the real altitude. You know, hyperbaric means decreased in barometric pressure, but for the same oxygen fraction, 20.93% of oxygen in the ambient air. That's the uh, type of altitude you will have in, in the mountain. But most of the hypoxic tent, hypoxic chamber, it is based on normobaric hypoxia. Instead of changing the barometric pressure, you only change the oxygen concentration. That will lead to the same effect, a reduction in the oxygen pressure. So you can perfectly match uh, hypobaric hypoxia and normobaric hypoxia. In one case, decreased in barometric pressure, in the other case, decreased in oxygen fraction. And one of the key question is, is it exactly the same? Is it exactly the same to sleep in altitude or to sleep in a chamber? So we've been looking with a, one of my friends who's a head physiologist of the French Nordic ski uh, team, uh, Laurent Schmidt. Uh, we did investigate uh, in a crossover design some Spanish triathletes. The first year, half of the group slept in hypoxic chamber and the second year they moved to real altitude to do live high train low and vice versa, you know. So it was a crossover. And at the end, we found that it's not exactly the same. You don't sleep exactly the same way. You don't breathe exactly the same way. But for performance-related parameter, and again, the most important one is total mass of hemoglobin, it was very close. We cannot say it is an advantage to do live high train low in real altitude in let's say, compared to simulated altitude. But uh, for uh, medical reason, we can also take into account that uh, there is a specific effect of hypobaria. Above the hypoxic effect, the severity of altitude is always a bit higher in real altitude than in simulated altitude. That's why when you set the altitude in an hypoxic chamber, you have to set the oxygen pressure as if you wanted a, a higher altitude. You, you understand? So if you want to have, to have your athletes to sleep at 2,700 in real altitude, then you find the location at 2,700. If you want to have them to sleep at 2,700 in an hypoxic chamber, and it is, for example, 14% of oxygen to be at 2,700, then you will set the oxygen fraction a bit lower as if it would be 3,000. Mm. The severity of altitude is uh, higher in real compared to simulated altitude. Mm. We, are, we, um, uh, we believe that uh, simulated altitude is really of interest for many reasons. You can much easily, much more easily uh, adapt the hypoxic dose, the stress, athletes by athletes. You know, if you are in Boulder, it's difficult to move. If you are in an hypoxic uh, facilities, you can have one room at 2,700 and one room at, 2000, at 2,200. It's much better to individualize the training. You have to take into account the differences and now there's a vast body of literature showing that it is not exactly the same. But again, performance-wise, it's about the same benefits to use simulated versus high altitude. Versus, sorry, real altitude. Yeah, okay, that, that's really, really interesting knowledge uh, to, to hear that, it, that you can actually achieve, achieve the same performance benefits and, uh, and perhaps with the advantage or with the advantage of being able to more easily uh, individualize the, the altitude and adjust it according to the individual's needs. Very, very interesting. Um, 
we have talked for quite a long time and we did talk before the interview about a, f- a number of case studies that you have conducted with, uh, among others, Kilian Journey and uh, Roman Bardet. Uh, but I don't think we have time to talk about all of them, unfortunately. I will link to your research gate profile and people can find them. I, I do want to ask you about one very recent uh, case study that you published, which uh, was uh, called 11 Years Monitoring of the World's Most Successful Male Biathlete uh, of the Last Decade. So can you just give a brief overview of uh, what this case study was about and, and discuss things like the training intensity distribution that you found and also your use of heart rate variability in uh, or the monitoring with heart rate variability with this athlete? Yes, uh, first of all, we are very grateful to Martin Fourcade uh, to let us use his training data. It is a study we did conduct with uh, the head physiologist of the Nordic ski of the French Nordic ski, Nordic ski team and with the coach of Martin. Uh, so, uh, as you said, we, we had previous case study with Romain Bardet in cycling and Kilian Jornet in uh, ski mountaineering and trail running. And it is of interest to to understand that uh, between this uh, top athletes in different sports, many, many similarities in terms of training distribution, use of altitude, and so on and so on. So there are some basics now uh, that uh, are needed uh, to perform at the world level. And one of the compulsory parameters is the use of altitude. You know, we've been involved in a sometimes quite, uh, uh, I would say, um, passionate debate about uh, the fact that altitude training could be or not be effective anymore for the athletes who have already, you know, very high VO2 max, very high uh, HB mass value. We believe that uh, even this top champion, they still can use altitude training to get this 2 to 4% improvement in VO2 max, hemoglobin mass, and then performance post-altitude. So the, the fact that uh, Martin Fourcade uh, let us use the, his training data is, is interesting because, as you said, uh, we did monitor the training intensity distribution. Um, I don't know if you did interview uh, Stephen Saylor about yes. polarized training already. Yes, we have. Yes, so you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, we did observe some very strong relationship between the low training volume between the two threshold in the heavy domain and the number of the number of top three um, podium during World Cup events, you know. It means the most polarized Martin's training was, the most successful he was. And we used our trade viability to monitor his adaptation. You know, I was talking about the use of our trade viability during the altitude training camp, uh, more and more elite athletes use heart rate variability year long because it's a very easy, accurate, and non-invasive way to uh, monitor the autonomous nervous system responses, the way you will adapt to the training load. I would recommend the, uh, the athletes to use uh, heart rate variability always, but uh, especially during the uh, critical period of the season. And one of the critical period is obviously altitude training. But it's also very useful when you have jet lag. It's very useful when you, when you are doing hip training, or it's very useful if you are starting to manipulate your diet. Every critical period that can lead to overreaching or that can lead to... Uh, large amount of fatigue and counterperformance, HRV is, in my view, uh, a very interesting uh, method. And for Martin, uh, we had some very nice relationship between improvement in the parasympathetic related parameter of HRV, number of podium per year, and uh, polarized training. Uh, just to come back quickly to the case study we, we had on uh, with uh, Kilian Jornet. Uh, uh, Kilian is a good example of, of someone who did practice leave high, train, low and high. Uh, 
He was sleeping in an hypoxic tent. He was training. Uh, most of the training was low, but he was also doing one session high using a mask system. So it is of interest to see that uh, this... Uh, um, top athletes are feeling what could be the best for them and it's uh, very close to our recommendations. That's why it was of interest for us also to, to have this case study about the preparation of Kilian before the uh, Mount Everest record a few years ago. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. And as I, I, as I told you before the interview, but I'll tell the listeners now, I'm currently reading uh, Kilian's autobiography uh, Above the Clouds or his book Above the Clouds, which includes the Everest record, and uh, but also just his general upbringing and training throughout his life. And it's a fascinating book and that I would recommend to, to all the listeners. And as you say, very interesting to, to hear about his training and altitude adaptation. One follow-up about uh, Martin and his the case that you did with him. Uh, was the HRV monitoring only monitoring or did he actually use it so in to, to adapt training or adjust training if the HRV was low, he maybe didn't do the intense training he had planned and so on? Uh, yeah, that's uh, something that is used uh, uh, because the, the monitoring was done by uh, Laurent, you know, who was uh, the head physiologist. After that, uh, I don't know exactly uh, the extent uh, that uh, that means I don't know exactly if the training was really uh, modified on a daily basis. Yeah. Because as, as you, as you uh, mentioned, uh, there are now some um, way of prescribing training based on the morning HRV. We did a study that we called the guided HRV uh, leave high train low. So we, we did, we did, uh, modify the leave high train low training, uh, for, uh, two weeks, just based on the HRV responses, uh, monitored in the morning. And in this study, we showed that, uh, leave high train low was more effective than if we didn't do that. So we had a control group with HRV, but the training was not modified. And we compare with this HRV guided uh, leave high train low period. So that's why we we believe that uh, it is of interest to do that, uh, especially because the risk of fatigue, the risk of overreaching, are very very high during this altitude training. You know, you the for the listener, I would like to to really to emphasize the fact that altitude training is not something that is neutral. It is an additional stress. It is uh, something that can be effective. And if well monitored, it can be really effective. Uh, you can get this 3 to 4% performance enhancement. That is huge at the elite level. But at the same time, I have many, many examples of large counter performance, poor performance post altitude training, simply because it is easy that you don't manage this additional stress in a proper way so yeah um, it can be uh at the elite level i go to altitude and i'll see now it doesn't work because if you see it's likely that you will be overtrained overreach post altitude that's good advice so final question before the rapid fire questions uh if you can give Three pieces of advice to athletes and or coaches. You can choose, you can mix. What would those key pieces of advice be? And, and I want to hear, uh, just mention for the listeners that you also have a very extensive experience as, uh, as a great triathlete yourself back in the day and, uh, and a triathlon coach as well. So you're not just an academic that gives this advice, but with somebody with great applied knowledge as well. Right. So my first uh, advice will be uh, to monitor uh, your responses, hydration, heart rate, heart rate viability, saturation, in a very accurate way, especially during the first week, the first uh, week of acclimatization. For me, it's, it is a complete nonsense to go to altitude without uh, a monitoring system in place. The so second piece of advice is to monitor your post-altitude 
responses, just your feeling, you know. It can be using like a visual analogic scale of fatigue, uh, your mood and so on, post altitude to determine what can be the best uh, timing for performance post altitude. If you are lucky and you get the full support of physiologists, it can be done in a, let's say, sophisticated way. But an athlete by himself can use his feeling or simply uh, training uh, uh, data to identify what can be the optimal timing for the performance post altitude. And my third advice is again that altitude training is not neutral. That means Coaches and athletes, they have to educate themselves. You can't use altitude training just once before a competition. It has to be something that has to be integrated in the development of youth athletes. It has something that you have to replicate to improve how you, you behave, how you train, how you recover, and so on. Uh, and it is something then that can really be used uh, very, very often. Uh, as long as you know exactly what to do. And, and if you can give one piece of advice that is general, uh, not just related to altitude, but anything within endurance sports, what would that be? My advice would be polarized training and HRV. All right. And finally, let's uh, move on to the rapid fire questions. So take just one quick sentence to answer these. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? I have two uh, books that I really like, the one of uh, Hutchinson, Endure, and the other one from Marcora, How Bad Do You Want It? How Bad Do You Want It is from uh, Matt Fitzgerald, but... Uh, oh, yeah, you know, it's about uh, Matt Fitzgerald, sorry, but yeah. it's um, based also on some Marcora's theory. Exactly, yeah, yeah both. Yeah, sorry, 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 you're, you're completely right, and I like the... By the way, I like the, the way uh, Hutchinson is, uh, is writing uh, about endurance. I think it's uh, very often it's very relevant and interesting. Yeah, I, I often refer to his articles, definitely. I agree with that. Uh, <laughs> what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? My, pers my personal mean as, a, as an athlete or as an academic? It's, it's up to you. You can choose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just hard work. I think uh, to be uh, to not be discouraged uh, at the first failure. You know, success is just uh, one percent uh, inspiration and ninety-nine percent uh, perseverance. Yeah. And finally, who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? Uh, again, um, I don't have any any athletes uh, that is like a hero for me. But I'm very impressed by uh, Kilian Jornet. I'm impressed by his performance, obviously, you know, 92 of VO2 max. But I am also impressed by the way he's sharing his data and the way he's conducting his career. It is uh, quite uh, uncommon to have the freedom to do whatever you want as an elite athlete, you know, because you have to be on this competition. You cannot set your own competition and uh, he was able, he's still very young, but he was able to change his goal and to be successful uh, in different sports, uh, now in uh, mountaineering. So he, he's a good, uh, for me, he's a good example uh, of somebody who can be a, a real elite athlete, but in the same time uh, to be an adventurer. Uh, to be, uh, and I think that's, is it correct, adventurer? Yeah, uh, yeah, like, yeah exactly. Yes, and that's why, I, that's why I think he's uh, inspiring so many, uh, so many people. Beyond the athletics performance, there is also the freedom to, that he can choose his goals and, and choose his life. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you're absolutely right. His personality has inspired a lot of people, uh, not so much from his performances, which are uh, out of his world, really. And uh, a lot of people probably can't relate to them, but just the way that he, uh, he also uh, isn't, isn't necessarily like taking them too seriously. For him, it's all about, at the end of the day, enjoying what he loves the most. And uh, that's something that I think has inspired countless people and uh, uh, me as well. 
So definitely a good. Uh, and and just the last comment, I think the 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 very exceptional athletes, you know, the guys who's number, the, these guys who are number one, most of them are very curious. They are interested to understand what's going on for them. Okay, obviously they train hard, they compete hard, so they don't have time to really, uh, let's say, publish. But they are reading. They are they are aware of what's going on. So. Uh, and science and sports science are really moving forward at a quick pace. But it's impressive how these guys can uh, be in touch with the most recent uh, stuff uh, published in the in the field. Mm. Yeah, so be curious, work hard, and be curious. Yeah, oh, great, great advice, absolutely great. So, Gregor, uh, where can the listeners uh, keep up with your updates when you have new research and stuff? Uh, Twitter, perhaps, uh, ResearchGate, anything else you want to mention? Uh, I think Twitter is the best way. Uh, ResearchGate, if you really want to, to go deep in the publication, but Twitter is a very nice way to be in touch with the sports science community and also to see the interaction between athletes and, and uh, support staff and scientists. Twitter is, is good. So my Twitter is uh, Grégoire Millet 1. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kriwa. It was really great to have you on and uh, thank you so much for your uh, generous use of time for, for this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And uh, I will follow you uh, on a regular basis now. <laughs> thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that interview and learned a lot from it. I know that I certainly learned a lot of things that I was not aware of before about altitude training. So super fascinating to talk with uh, Grégoire and uh, very generous of him to to give so much time to the podcast. So uh, I'm very appreciative for that. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with links to uh, to Grégoire's uh, Twitter, ResearchGate and university profile pages as well as some of the key studies and papers that we've mentioned, uh, so including, for example, the case study with uh, Martin Foucault and several of the other key papers or key topics that we discussed. I won't list them all here, but you can find them in the, in the show notes or in the episode description. On Thursday, we'll have another Q&A, and then on Monday, we will have a training talk with coach Sebastian Zeller from Germany, who was recommended as a guest by coach Dan Lorang, who is the coach of Jan Frodeno and uh, Anne Haug, uh, of course, a past guest of the podcast. If you haven't listened to that, go and do so. I haven't yet conducted the interview with Sebastian, but uh, that is a fantastic stamp of approval to, to have to be recommended by Dan. So, uh, so that should be a fantastic interview. If you are searching for training plans or coaching services, uh, now is a great time to do so as we are kind of in the off season and uh, building up towards 2021, where hopefully we'll have a bit more races than we had this year. Uh, so go and check out scientifictriathlon.com and what we have to offer there. And uh, do send me an email if you have any questions or queries to michael at scientifictriathlon.com. And that's Michael with a K. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take your free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15% off your order with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.